It's the third week of Advent, a season when we focus on the birth of Jesus Christ. Our passage for today is found in the second chapter of Matthew 2. So pull out your Bible if you want to do some underlining or writing in the margins as I normally do when I hear someone preach, or if you want to be techy, pull out your phone or tablets for note taking later. But for now, you can also read this on the screen. So, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to talk about the wise men in the story. When it comes to the real Christmas story, we need to erase from our brains the hallmark cards and presentations of the gospel that told us two erroneous so-called facts of the nativity story. The first one is that there were not three wise men. The Bible never says how many there were. Over the centuries, people assumed there were three kings because three gifts were brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We don't know if one person bought all three. There could have been a Black Friday sale and one guy clean, cleared up, cleaned up and undiscounted gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Such a deal. Now, there was at least more than one. But in the earliest of times, according to the scholar William Barclay, tradition said there were 12 wise men in the Christmas story. And then later, legends made them kings. And then later, legends gave them names. Caspar, also known as Jaspar, or Gaspar, and Melchior, and Balthazar, even attributing who gave what gifts. So sorry to burst your bubble. We don't know how many. So instead of singing, we three kings of Orient are, we should just make it more general. We should just sing, we the kings of Orient are. Second, they were not kings. They were called magi. Now, who were the Magi, and what does that word mean? Actually, Magi is not an easy word to translate. Greek historian Herodotus says they were probably from a tribe in a country we today called Iran. But back then, it was known as Media or Medea. The people were called the Medes. They were part of the Persian Empire. The Magi were skilled in medicine, philosophy, and natural science says they were soothsayers, meaning they were sayers of sooth. I'm kidding. All I want for Christmas are my two front sooths. I'm, I'm kidding. Kids, soothsayers meant they were truth sayers, sayers of truth, interpreters of dreams, astrologers. But clearly from this episode in the Bible, 
we know that the Magi played an incredibly important role. They were the ones who found the Messiah. They were the ones who read the stars and figured it out. They were the ones who risked a long journey uh, with the faith that a Savior was coming. They were the ones who protected baby Jesus and Joseph and Mary so that they would not be killed by the evil King Herod, who was super paranoid of anyone who would threaten his power. The third erroneous narrative about the wise men is that the, the wise men never showed up at the innkeeper's barn where Joseph and Mary saw the birth of their child. In verse 11, right? It says, the magi came not to a barn or a stable or a manger. They came to a house. Check it out. When I discovered this in seminary, I was crushed. All those pictures on cards and in movies and ancient paintings of three kings in a stable with Jesus, all wrong. But some scholars say, well, maybe. The barn was in a cave in the rear of a house, so Jesus was born in a stable, and then out of compassion, uh, they were somehow allowed to go into a house nearby. And then later, the Magi came. But scholars can't figure out if the Magi arrived soon after the birth or as much as two months later. You know, with no Apple Watch, arriving a month later could be seen as on time back then. So, after this historical context, let me get to the point of the sermon. And here it is. We all need wise men and wise women in our lives. The more, the better. Three, twelve, one, whatever. For us to believe that we don't need mentors or people who can speak into our lives means life is going to be harder than it has to be. So listen to these scriptures as to why we need wisdom and how we can get it. Proverbs 1.5 says, let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. Proverbs 3.7 don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Proverbs 9.9, 9, instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. So the point is, wise people listen and are instructed by wise people and it adds to their life, makes it more better. If you think you can be wise on your own, you are unwise. I need wise people in my life, not only for the long haul, but at times for a short, specific shot in the arm. We shouldn't be afraid to ask for help. You know, when my, my dad died, I called up three friends to help me get through the grief, which was a deep grief, especially since my dad was not a Christian. I needed help. I reached out. One was Dallas Willard. One of my great regrets in life is that I didn't reach out to him more. Today, I have a spiritual director, one who I can call now and then to help me see what God is doing in my life. Where is God active? What is he trying to say to us as I, I lead the church? And you might think, Dan, you're the senior pastor. You're supposed to know God's will immediately and instinctively. Wish that were true. There is so much static and challenge and crazy change in life. It's hard at times. And you and I have to be humble enough to know we're not as smart or as strong or as wise as, as we may think we are. We all need help. And by the way, my spiritual director's birthday is December 25. Can't get better than that. He's got to be brilliant. I believe we all need wise men or wise women in our lives to help us navigate life. No one is an island. We must be humble enough to seek and accept them. As we often say in our staff, more eyes, clearer vision. That's the best way to make important decisions and generally to live life. Get more eyes on the big decisions in your life and in your business. So here's what this Bible passage can tell us about wise men or women that we need in our, in our lives. Wise women and wise men, number one, they may not look like how we think they would. Number two, they may at first seem weaker than we. And number three, they can save our lives. 
So first, wise people may not look how we think they would. If I were a first century Jewish person thinking who would give us a direction, some prophetic word of who and where and when the Messiah might come, I would have guessed it would be likely a Jew, since I would be thinking this is a Jewish Messiah to save Jewish people. Maybe it's a Jewish religious leader, maybe even a Pharisee or a Sadducee, maybe a long shot, uh, maybe it's some good person from Herod's palace. But no way, no way would I think it would be a Gentile, a pagan, an astrologer, some person who's a Persian, some soothsayer who might not even sooth well and might not even believe in the Jewish God Jehovah. No way would it be some stargazer who's not even looking for the Big Dipper. But if you thought that, you would be wrong on all accounts. Now, I'm not saying go to your local astrologer or bring out a Ouija board, you know, no, both would not be good. And actually, according to the Bible, that's like sinful. There are spiritual reasons for that, but that's a different sermon. Way more better would be to seek a wise, Christ-centered person to help you. And that person may not look like how you would have thought. Might be a lot younger, might be a lot older, might be of a different culture, might be like my spiritual director who is 82 years old. He's kind of like my Gandalf or Merlin to King Arthur. He lives in Southern California. I met him in Honolulu. He's a Jesuit priest who has taught people how to be spiritual directors. And you might think, what? A Catholic? A Jesuit? You should have a Protestant, Dan. As I said, wise men or women come in many shapes and forms. They might be quite different than you or in another state or country, a different culture. I would say, as long as they are a follower of the Messiah, as the wise men in the Bible were desperate to follow the star to find the Messiah, so they might be a good mentor to you. By the way, I love what Tim Shaw has taught me. He says he never says that he is a mentor to anyone. If someday a person calls Tim his or her mentor, then he will acknowledge he's a mentor to that person. But he's not so bold or presumptive as to say, I am your mentor, or that I, Tim Shaw, mentor so-and-so. It has to come from the one being mentored to say who the mentor is. And truly, in any mentoring relationship, it's often both ways. Um, I started a small group of young pastors, and truly, they teach me a lot. I would never say I am their mentor. Besides, they don't always listen to me anyway. Okay, second point. Wise men, or wise women and wise men, they may at first seem weaker than we. Sometimes we may think a wise person in our lives are those who seem like they don't have as many problems as you. They seem to have it all together. They're stronger. But sometimes that is not as helpful as the one who doesn't have it all together. As many of you know, that my all-time favorite TV series is The West Wing. And one of my favorite scenes is when Leo, Leo, the chief of staff, is telling Josh, the White House deputy chief of staff, a story. He says, this guy's walking down the street when he falls in a hole. The walls are so steep he can't get out. A doctor passes by, the guy shouts up, hey you, can you help me out? And the doctor writes a prescription, throws it down in the hole, moves on. Then a priest comes along and the guy shout, shouts up, Father, I'm down in a hole, can you help me out? And the priest writes out a prayer, throws it down in the hole, moves on. Then a friend walks by, hey Joe, it's me, can you help me out? And the friend jumps in the hole. And our guy says, you stupid, now we're both down here. And the friend says, yeah, but I've been down here before and I know the way out. Sometimes our best mentors are those who have suffered as we have. They're far from perfect and they know the way out. That's why Alcoholics Anonymous can work if we let it. That's why our staff tries to be very authentic about our own failures and weaknesses because we are the people who have fallen in the hole. As one of our core values of this church is authenticity. We should feel free to say 
We are the people of the whole. We know what it's like to fall into a dark place and feel alone. Third point, wise women and wise men, they can save lives. Wise women can be wonder women. Wise men can be supermen. You know, we heard from Terry George earlier how a friend, a wise woman, gave him a different perspective on suffering in the world. And it transformed his thinking and fueled a faith and a passion to help people all over Hawaii. He is doing good and he's fighting evil. Remember, in today's Bible story, the wise men are wise enough to know that evil King Herod is not playing with a full deck of cards. He's one taco short of a 10-pack. He is evil. And because they are spiritual, they are open to prophetic dreams. And in a dream from God, they were told, don't go back to Herod. Don't betray baby Jesus. Wise people help us know how to escape evil and how not to betray Jesus. Wise people understand the supernatural ways of God. Wise people help us do good and help others. Wise people point us to Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came to this earth, the wisest of all human beings to save us. It is Christ that would really give us hope and life. It is this Jesus that the Christmas star shone its light on, on Bethlehem nights to lead the wise men. And if you know anything about astronomy and light years, think about this. The light from that Christmas star had to be beaming thousands of light years prior to land on and to be seen on that specific Christmas night by the wise men. God made it all happen according to his design and providence. God formed a star and sent it light, light since it's light thousands of years prior to make it be seen on earth right on those nights for the wise men to see. You know, we can try to do good without God, but if we try to do good with the Almighty God, we are even more empowered. And if we feel life is not good, no, God is there trying to talk to you, but sometimes we never like, listen! Jesus can be better seen to be in your presence if we have wise people around us to point to the North Star of faith in him. I want to close with one of my favorite movies made in 1941. I'm not going to show it to you, but tell you about it. It's called Meet John Doe, starring Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck. You young people need to know that these two actors were kind of the Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman of the times, super famous and popular. So famous is this film that the American Film Institute in 2006 ranked it number 49 of the best films in the last 100 years. It's a great list, which I believe in because the American Film Institute chose as its number one movie, my favorite movie, It's a Wonderful Life, that great Christmas story. Star Wars, by the way, came in at number 39. The Meet John Doe, the movie Meet John Doe, is basically about a newspaper columnist, played by Barbara Stanwyck, who made up a story about how a common man, whom she called John Doe, wrote a letter that said, in response to the city's economic stress and slimy politics, he would jump off the top of, of City Hall as a protest. And that letter printed in the newspaper caused such a ruckus from the newspaper readers who wanted to help him that the newspaper decided that they had to find a homeless guy, played by Gary Cooper, to be this fictitious John Doe who would go around to tell people to be good and, and, and do good to combat the evil in the world and to not give up. Suddenly, thousands of people would show up to hear him speak. And in one of his speeches, where he's telling them to show more love, he says this, I know a lot of you are saying to yourselves, he's asking for a miracle to happen. He's expecting people to change all of a sudden. Well, you're wrong. It's no miracle. It's no miracle. Because I see it happen once every year. And so do you at Christmas time. There's something swell about the spirit of Christmas to see what it does to people, all kinds of people. Now, why can't that spirit, that same warm Christmas spirit, last the whole year round? 
Gosh, if it ever, if it ever did, if each and every John Doe would make that spirit last 365 days out of the year, we'd develop such a strength, we'd create such a tidal wave of goodwill that no human force could stand against it. Yes, sir, my friends, the meek can only inherit the earth when the John Doe's start loving their neighbors. You'd better start right now. Don't wait till the game is called on account of darkness. Wake up, John Doe. You're the hope of the world. Well, he could see it was making a difference. It starts a, a huge grassroots movement with the simple slogan of, be a better neighbor. But then he discovers that the newspaper publisher is using him and secretly channeling his popularity into the publisher's desire for a national political campaign. And John Doe is so mad at this that he says he will, he will expose the plot at a rally, but on the night of the rally, the publisher speaks first, and he falsely accuses John Doe and says that he's a fake, and, that, and the publisher claims he was, he was deceived by this trickery. And so despondent is John Doe, so betrayed he knows that now he has let down all these people he told to be honest and good, that he then decides that he will actually, on Christmas Eve, jump from the roof of City Hall. And so on that cold, dark Christmas Eve night, he goes up on a high tower with a viewing deck, and in that climactic closing scene, the wind is blowing and swirling snow all around him. It's freezing. He goes up to the railing when suddenly that reporter, played by Barbara Stanwyck, who's now fallen in love with him, races out of the darkness and grabs him and says this, please don't give up. We'll start all over again. Just you and I. It isn't too late. The John Doe movement isn't dead yet. We can start clean now, just you and I. It'll grow, John, and it'll grow big because it'll be honest this time. Oh, John, if it's worth dying for, it's worth living for. Oh, please, John. You want to be honest, don't you? Well, you don't have to die to keep the John Doe ideal alive. Someone already died for that once the first John Doe, and he's kept that ideal alive for nearly 2,000 years. It was he who kept it alive in them, and he'll go on keeping it alive forever and always for every John Doe movement. These men kill, a new one will be born. And that's why those city bells are ringing, John. They're calling to us not to give up, but to keep on fighting, to keep on pitching. Don't you see? This is no time to give up. And so I say to you today, don't give up. Maybe you're feeling down. In the movie, the John Doe character doesn't give up. And maybe, you, maybe you've had it with the economic stress, or the politics, or the health, or the money issues you have. Maybe you're feeling suicidal. Maybe you want to harm yourself. I say to you today, wherever you are, don't give up. Yes, someone died for you. Yes, you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, who came on Christmas Day. And if there's evil in the world, God didn't bring it. But he's asking you and me, like Terry George earlier, and all of the John Doe's, to fight the good fight. For God came to you on a Bethlehem night to tell you not to give up. For as the shepherds heard on that famous glorious night from an angel, do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you, yes you, is born this day in Bethlehem in the city of David, a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Amen. 
So let's pray. Please join me. Lord, I know um, people are listening to this all over Hawaii, on the mainland, and around the world. And I pray in your timing, with the Holy Spirit, you're reaching out to them wherever they may be. And in your timing, you're telling people to not give up. This has been a really hard season, not only in America, but around the world. So many things have changed. So many things are pressuring us. So many things are hard. And I pray right now that you might speak to them, that you might bring wise men and women into their lives, and that they might turn to you. I pray, Lord, that there are some here who have been thinking for a while about you, and maybe they've been on the fence or maybe far from the fence, but maybe today, through you, they're saying, okay, I want to give this a shot. If you are who you say you are, as one John or Jane Doe, I'm going to try and, and trust you, Jesus. And on this Christmas season, in 2020, I want to trust you. And so, Lord, I pray that if there are any people who are thinking that, they may, may just say a short prayer with me right now, which is basically just, sorry, thank you, please. And so that, if that's in your heart, just follow me in the silence of your hearts and just say basically this prayer. Hey, Lord, sorry maybe that I've ignored you or been away from you, but thank you that you love me so much and that you've been reaching out to me especially today. And I just want to say, please come into my life because I want to follow you and try to the best of my ability to learn more about you and maybe even dedicate my whole life to you. So thank you. In Christ's name, amen. The wonderful thing about being a follower of Jesus is that he is with us all the time. And I would like to say a blessing to affirm that fact in your life so please receive this blessing may the lord bless you and keep you may his face shine upon you and his grace surround you and may you know deep in your heart that all the wisdom comes from god the father the son and the holy spirit may this season be the best christmas season in your life in christ's name amen god bless you all Merry Christmas and a hooey ho. See on camera, I can't burp. If it's live, I'm far, I can walk back from the microphone. Little tricks of the trade. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> now if you're new, make sure that you check out the chat feature, which is gonna be a lot, oh, sorry. I was like, do I? I was like, do I? I psych myself out with my hands. All right. For Matt and Keani and Honolulu. <laughs> no, don't stop it. Just leave it. Just leave it. All right. This is the last time. For Matt and Keani in Honolulu. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, no. I said it how you wanted me to. Ugh. See what I do. Yes, <laughs> you No. Come on. Ryan's gonna time. think I'm crazy. Alright, come on. It's like, um, casting a shadow on All right, all right. No, 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 For Matt and Keani in Honolulu. <laughs> Honolulu? It's fine, it's fine. Uh, just say it normally, just say it how you do. Honolulu? Hon Hon I don't even know how I say it anymore. <laughs> okay, go for it. Happy... What was okay, it? Okay, it's an anniversary from Ruth at Plaza Punch Bowl. Okay, final segment. Almost done. Okay, ready? <laughs> <laughs>